I'll start talking about Griffin, uh, even though I think he's taking up on uh, breakfast over there. We want to make sure he has the fuel to continue and give us his uh, really important talk, which is uh, anomalous head positions, force nerve palsies, and the three-step uh, Bilkowski test. Uh, I just want to uh, thank Dr. Uh, Jardine for volunteering to take on many positions, uh, being responsible for our wellness and being our assistant program director. I don't know if any of you know this, but uh, he got tapped to be the assistant program director even before he arrived in Utah. So thank you. All right. I'm, uh, uh, before I begin, I just want to say how actually how grateful I am to be here. I, in medical school, uh, was a, uh, I've told the story a couple of times, but I was kind of a wandering third year student not having picked a career, and Jeff Petty pulled me aside and said, you should look into ophthalmology. And uh, that's essentially what led me to, to choose the field that I did. And my dream job was to come back here. So I really couldn't be more grateful to be here. Felt so supported and just loved the collaborative and collegial environment of the, of the Moran. So uh, I, I'm sure you were all just dying and to get here when you saw the topics. It's just a business today. It's arguably the sexiest stuff in ophthalmology, right? <laughs> so the, um, hopefully, though, this talk is really targeted towards um, just the fundamentals of the three-step test, uh, um, fourth nerve palsies, and, and uh, the, you know, approaching the pediatric eye exam. So I may not get into a lot of the nuances, but I, hopefully this at the very least will be helpful to residents for OCAPs and give everybody just a, a really basic and appropriate knowledge of when uh, these tests are appropriate and how to evaluate these, these children. Of no financial disclosures, a lot of these pictures were taken from my fellowship at Indiana. So I just want to acknowledge that. So, um, as you can see, the, just like the boring title stated, this, we're going to go through uh, um, anomalous head positions, three-step test, um, and then talk about the, the congenital versus acquired causes of the of fourth nerve palsies uh, with some surgical considerations. So, uh, the, um, a case that I saw about midway through my fellowship, which I thought was quite interesting, is uh, five-year-old boy who came in with a diagnosis of torticollis and was scheduled by orthopedics for a sternocleidomastoid release because of the, because of the torticollis. Um, the insurance delayed or rejected the, uh, you know, didn't, it didn't get pre-approved essentially, and so the family came to see us in the interim. Uh, and this is, just, this is actually my son, this is an actor, not, not, not the actual patient. We came in with this big head tilt. <laughs> Yeah, I know we're kind of a Weasley family. So, the um, so uh, patient comes in with this head tilt, and he was a lot younger, a lot less cooperative um, than than my seven year old son. But the uh, well, our, actually, that's probably not true. But the uh, um, as he came in, it was really a tough exam to really figure out what was driving this head tilt. But in moving his neck, the neck was really mobile. I didn't feel like there was any really tightness in the neck muscles. So we did one of my favorite strabismus or anomalous head position tests, and that is the patch test. So I got this kid's mom to put a patch over one eye and the head straightened right out. So we're going we're to come back and you know, try to explain why, why that happens in, in these ophthalmologic driven anomalous head positions. But, and forgive me, maybe I hope this isn't appropriate to be interactive in grand rounds. I just can't talk for 20 minutes straight. I'll start boring myself. So, can I ask, what, what is the differential for anomalous head positions that we see, that uh, ophthalmology causes? Fourth nerve palsies. Classic. Yeah. Catch the low, grab the low-hanging fruit. Fourth nerve palsies, what else? Spasmus of the tail. Oh, nice, yeah. Anything else? Nystagmus. Nystagmus, great one, yeah. The no point of nystagmus, exactly. Anything else come to mind? Yeah, Duane, yeah, so yeah, all forms of strabismus like Duane's and the more, some of the more. So six nerve palsies, we often see a head, a head turn away from the, the eye that can't adduct. Um, the uh, nice dog is no point. Um, do you think in strabismus causes of anomalous head positions, it's more common with competent or incompetent strabismus? Yeah, inc yeah incompetent, definitely. <laughs> I know Bob's going to talk about A and V patterns. We see it with. Uh, um, uh, pattern strabismus as well, like an isotrope with a V pattern, will often put their chin down to bring the, the use the V pattern to their advantage to actually try to um, potentially obtain fusion. 
ptosis. And interestingly, we see it even in, um, I such an infant last week, uh, about a five month old with unilateral congenital ptosis that had a dramatic head up position just to get, now that one eye looked just fine, but just to get the other eye engaged and have to allow fusion, this child, as soon as they had control of their neck muscles, was putting their head up to try to get that, um, find that head position where they can use both eyes. Um, interestingly, we see it sometimes with refractive errors uh, and then the congenital ET, you know, they have the cross fixation, but these patients are at high risk of developing amblyopia, so if they develop fixation preference, they'll, they, they often have limited abduction and you see a head turn towards the, um, using, using the eye that they're um, preferring. So this is a, a, an interesting case, uh, just to point out the differential of a case in Indiana, a girl who once put in glasses, the anomalous head position went away. So it's not always strabismus or some of these nystagmus, more common things, just even a, a refractive error can cause um, a head position. Uh, <coughs> what was that? that your no, the rest of these are actual patients. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't, I didn't, yeah, I know. The, um, so non-ocular causes, we do see, uh, so a lot of the pathology is during kind of mastoid muscle driving toward a collis. Um, uh, spinal deformity, injury, C-spine fractures, you know, so you get some acquired causes of um, torticollis or anomalous head positions. Dystonias, you know, unilateral hearing loss, they'll turn their good ear towards you. Uh, and so that could be, you know, easily mistaken for, you know, a head, an ocular driven head turn. Medications like phenothiazine can induce a dystonia, movement disorders. Um, so there's a lot, a large differential, but, but ophthalmologic causes are a common cause of these. So, most patients deserve a, 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 an evaluation by an ophthalmologist if they present this way. So my question to you is what drives this head position? I mean, a lot of these look pretty uncomfortable. At least let's, let's, let's talk about the fourth nerve palsy. Why, why would, you know, we, we see kids suppress one eye all the time, uh, develop amblyopia. I mean, this, this brilliant neuroadaptation that we have to avoid diplopia, right, is our brain just or suppress one eye, and that way you just use one eye. Why, why would the patients go to uncomfortable lengths to obtain fusion? Any thoughts? You prefer binocularity. Simply said, perfect, Ashley. Um, it, 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 I would even say they strongly prefer. It's a powerful drive that the brain has instinctually from, you know, time the child's four months old and can control their neck muscles. Um, you know, binocular fusion is far and away uh, plan A, suppression or squinting or all these other things are, are backup plans to, uh, if it's unobtainable. You know, occasionally you will see patients who can't get fusion will maximally displaced images um, to, uh, um, with a head, head turn, but more, more commonly they'll suppress one eye. Um, I like this quote from Bill Chowski. The patient chooses the least inconvenient position of the head by which the paretic muscle is sufficiently relieved so that binocular single vision can be obtained. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And um, going back to that uh, original case uh, that I, th with the patch test, when you break fusion, that drive is no longer there because there's only, they're, they're now monocular. So the patch test is a great way to test if it's an ophthalmology cause for the anomalous head position because uh, all of a sudden they have one eye and they'll just straighten right up. Or, or get rid of that turn, uh, so long as it's not the nice average null point. That obviously is uh, binocular or monocular. Do you, I assume in some cases it matters which eye you're patching, if you're patching the good or amblyopic eye. Yeah, if, if there is amblyopia, a lot of these cases who, that have the anomalous head position, they've been able to avoid amblyopia. So, so um, it, uh, yeah, it's, that's a great point. Like in a six nerve palsy, if you know, the right eye can't abduct, you'll get rid of that head turn by covering that eye up, but maybe not by covering the other eye. They'll still have that decreased abduction. Um, so the three-step parks Belchowski test. I, I, I didn't fully understand this until uh, um, probably at least, at least fellowship, when it's appropriate. Um, so could, did, any guesses? When, when is this test used? I missed that. What was that? Yep. Yeah, I, I would even say only vertical misalignments, um, and only in only in cases of isolated. Bob, I was, Bob's excited. You can barely hold back the answer. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the uh, 
the, um, so it's isolated vertical paretic muscles. So one muscle is out and that's it. Um, if there's multiple uh, muscles that are not working or if they're post-op or restrictive, um, it doesn't apply. So it's, it's a pretty narrow uh, patient population that you can apply this test to. Um, so st step is step one, two, three. Step, first step, which eye is, uh, is higher in primary gaze? Is it worse than left or right gaze? Worse than left or right head tilt? So I, um, I want to talk just for a second about the motility exam. So um, I, feel like, I feel like a lot of us memorize this pattern. And, and we pro I pro everyone here probably understands it pretty, pretty well. But I, I, I find it extraordinarily helpful to overlay the anatomy and just think about um, how, how these muscles work in abduction versus adduction. We spend a lot of time in, in, for OCAPs memorizing the primary, secondary, and tertiary um, actions of the extractive muscles. But I, I find that actually almost just not unhelpful memorization. Because if you just look at the anatomy, when, when the eye is abducting, so the eye's looking out here, all of a sudden the vertical muscles are in alignment to just, they're isolated in, in, in elevating or um, uh, you know, introducing the eye. Um, so in abduction, you are essentially isolating the vertical muscles in their, uh, or the, excuse me, the, the rectus muscles. And I remember Dr. Christensen, a, a Pisa ophthalmologist in my uh, residency in Oregon, used to say, the motility exam is, is designated to get the muscles in the field of gaze where they sing their solo. And I thought that was just a really catchy way of remembering this. So, in, in abduction and elevation, the right superior rectus is really doing almost all the elevation by itself. Um, uh, contrarily, when the eye is adducting, all of a sudden you see now, if this eye is turning in towards the nose, this muscle is now, the rectus is becoming more of an in cyclo torter than an elevator, and the superior oblique is now in position to move the eye. So, so, you know, since it's, uh, you know, it's an oblique, oblique angle, it actually moves the eye down, and the inferior oblique moves it up. So, it's, uh, that, that always to me is just really helpful in understanding motility. So um, we used to call these the dreaded nine pictures for OCAPs, where you have to figure out what's going on here. Um, so uh, walking through this three-step Bochowski test, again, I often thought as a resident you had to have a prism bar to, to sort this out. But that's not true, because it's, it's often evident just by looking at the motility. So any, any guesses which eye is up here? It's pretty subtle. If you had to guess? Left. Re really hard to tell, but it is left. Now that one you would be able to much more easily decipher with the alternate cover test. So, um, so you've got a left hypertropia. That's step one. Is it worse in right or left gaze? Right. Yeah, you see how, that, see how much higher that eye is than that eye? Whereas over here, that looks pretty ortho. So let me walk through this one by one. So if the left eye is up, uh, which muscles in the left eye are potentially not working? Now, we're thinking paretic muscles, right? Not restrictive. So would the paretic muscles be the elevators or the introductors? Yeah, so the left is up. It's the, it's the, it's the down-pulling muscles that are, that are, one of the two are not working. And you always have to remember that it could be that this, could, this patient could be having a right hypo in which case the elevators aren't working. So that's step one. You've isolated now. You've cut, you've cut down the muscles in half. We decided that it was worse in right gaze. So now, it's, now you know some muscles involved in right gaze. So you've limited it now to two muscles uh, in, in, in shorting out which, which one is paretic. And then you can see that it's much worse in left head tilt. So conveniently, when you, when you diagram this out, you just circle the muscles in the same alignment as the head tilt. So if it's, if it's worse than left head tilt, then you circle the muscles in kind of a, a tilt to the left. Um, yeah, and I often find and that third step always has thrown me off um, as a resident. Um, and, and, then, and also why it worsens so much in head tilt. Um, let me read this quote. So preferably one should remember that there is a head position in which the paretic muscle receives a minimum of impulses to contract. This is the position in which a patient with a paralyzed muscle habitually holds the head. So, so again, thinking about the superior oblique, it's, it's a big intorter. So 
Uh, our eyes are un incredible to maintain our horizon when we tilt left or right. I mean, they're, they're really almost like those uh, toys where the eyes stay still regardless of how you move the, move the, the, the doll or the toy. And uh, what, we wanted, what, what the patient is trying to do is they're trying to find the position where they're minimally using that superior oblique. So in left head tilt, this patient you know, has a left superior oblique palsy. In left head tilt, that left eye is trying to intort and the right eye, ex cyclotort. And in cyclotorsion involves, obviously, the majority of which is the superior oblique. Um, does anyone remember what other muscle is responsible for in torsion? Sinrad. Superior rectus. Yeah, perfect. So you think about this. So the superior rectus has in torsion uh, as, as one of its secondary functions. And then the superior oblique. But if the superior oblique is firing, is not firing, or at least in balance and compared to the superior rectus, what's going to happen to that eye as it tries to intort? It's going, it's, going to, it's going to get pulled up because the superior oblique, when it's functioning, kind of keeps it from pulling up and it just they both intort together. But you tilt the head the wrong way and then all of a sudden this imbalance causes that superior rectus to pull that eye up. So as you see this, so conveniently, when you circle, when this patient is turned to the left, you circle the two superior muscles, both involved in intorsion. Uh, now, the three-step test now, uh, if you think about an isolated vertical paretic muscle, the superior rectus, inferior oblique, and inferior rectus are all innervated by the third nerve. So they, they, they're just not commonly um, paretic in isolation. So this test is far and away most useful with the superior oblique palsy. We actually do see it, uh, we do see isolated paretic muscles of those three, but as you can imagine from kind of a neuroanatomical uh, basis, it's just less common. Um, so so the, the, the acronym for memorizing the three-step test um, for fourth nurse is SOS. If it's a right superior oblique palsy, you get a right hyper, worse than left gaze, and a right head tilt. So same, opposite, same. So just to, just to do some quick practices uh, uh, to, to put this into practice, if you had to guess, if, this, if you knew this was a fourth nerve palsy, which, which side is the palsy on? Right, yeah. So, so they come in, so they come in with a compensatory head position. So they have a left tilt because this would be worse in right head tilt. And it's same, opposite, same, that third step so we, this is so. Whenever I see a, ch a child uh, with a novice head position, the first thing I do, you're limited in how much the kid is going to participate in the exam. So, almost always in that novice head position, I try to get their head and I try to move them in whatever head position they're avoiding, because you almost always will see eyes splay or you'll you'll see my stagnus come out. So you grab this child, you turn the head the other way, and they get this huge deviation. Um, so you, that's right. So it's a right superior oblique palsy with a compensatory left head tilt. So where would this one be? Left. Left. I'm sorry. It's always not too rudimentary. Uh, left. So it would be worse in right or left gaze. So, yep. And sorry. So and that, and that left eye is trying to ex cycle. So here, that left eye is palsy, but in right head tilt. Remember, that left eye is now is being ex cyclotorted. And that's the opposite function of the superior oblique. So that superior oblique is maximally relaxed in that tilt, thus allowing for uh, fusion. Can you guys see which one it is here? Which, which side the palsy is on? Right, yeah. So, so part, part of this talk is hopefully to and make everybody feel a little bit more able to identify fourth nerve palsies without a prison bar, not feeling like they have to have all the tools that, that we are using regularly. And, um, in the Pete's Otho Clinic. This is subtle. Can you tell which, which way this man is tilting his head? He has a real subtle right tilt. So is it going to be worse in right or left gaze? So we assume it's a, if it's a right tilt, what, what side is the palsy on? Left. So it would be worse in right gaze. And there you can see that inferior oblique overaction coming up as he looks up, as he looks off to the right. So again, what do you think? What ga what's worse than left or right gaze? What would you guess? 
So what head tilt is he going to be worse in? So, so this is the compensatory head position. That, 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 that's what always threw me off, right? So you've got to make sure that you're not, when you think about same, opposite, same, it's, it's where the deviation is worse for the three-step test. So it's a left head tilt, it's a compensatory head tilt, be worse in right tilt and left gaze. There he is in left gaze. Again, not, not overly obvious, but you look at the bottom of the, the, the limbus of the right eye versus the, the inferior border of the limbus of the left eye. You can tell that, that is actually um, higher. So just another uh, kind of interesting, trend, an interesting point about um, fourth nerve palsies is the, uh, the majority of these are, are uh, congenital. Interestingly, a lot of people will have it come out later in life as their ability to fuse the eyes decreases or breaks. Um, so can you tell which way this gentleman is tilting his head? Left. Interestingly, um, just by looking at him, you can, you can tell if this is congenital or acquired. The way you tell is a congenital fourth nerve palsy actually will develop mid-face hypoplasia on the side that they're tilting towards. The way that you diagnose that is you draw a line from their, kind of from their, through their eyes and then through either edge of their mouth and you'll see that these are not parallel. He actually has, he's developed from a chronic left head tilt uh, a, a unilateral mid-face hypoplasia. So this is one of the reasons that we try to fix these early is it actually does affect the way that you're your uh, facial anatomy um, develops. So we tilt, so again, you see a left head tilt, you just tilt them the other way, um, and, and then that, there, that hyperdeviation comes out in a really big inferior oblique overaction. Here again, you can see right head tilt. Now, can you appreciate the mid-face hypoplasia there? The, the distance from the corner of his mouth to the lateral canthus is shorter on this side than it is on that side. You draw the lines there and you can see it's just, just subtle. So this is a case from a textbook in 1967. This is a lifelong head tilt that, that caused that amount of mid-face hypoplasia and deviation from von Norden's text in, in 1967. I thought that was just a really striking picture. So, I don't know if you can see these numbers. Can you see these numbers at all here, or is it too small? It's probably too small. So, this is a case that I saw just a week ago. I just want to try, this is a three-step test, that a patient that seemed a little unusual because they had superior oblique overaction in the left eye. So, there's a right hyper in primary gaze. So, what muscles should we circle for the step one? Let's start with the right eye. What, what muscle, if it's a right hyper, what muscles on the right do we think are not working. Perfect. And then the left eye, the opposite, right? So step two, is it worse in right or left gaze? Well, in right gaze, there's a right intermittent hyper of 14, and then ortho and left gaze. So what muscles are you going to circle for step two? On the right eye. Right superior rectus and right inferior rectus and the left eye. Left inferior, left superior, left. yep, perfect. And then if you look away over here, you can barely see this, but it's worse in right head tilt uh, as compared to left head tilt. So I drop to the right. So this patient actually had an isolated left inferior oblique palsy, which is, you, you think it'd be extraordinarily rare, extraordinarily rare, again, based on that kind of neuroanatomical basis. But the, it turns out you actually do see a fair amount of these. Um, uh, you know, you know, in the literature. Um, and so, so this patient had not had surgery, had not had any uh, um, trauma, in, this, in which case this test was appropriate. So just to review, isolated paretic muscles only, doesn't work in post-op or restrictive cases. Um, so you, yeah, this is a bad question, but you, you of course never use this in a six nerve palsy, it's not, it's not vertical. And you wouldn't use it in a thyroid eye disease patient or a myasthenia patient because it's not an isolated paretic muscle. Um, we, see, we see bilateral cases uh, where they, it, they sometimes will have a hyper, but then you'll see alternating uh, inferior oblique overaction when they look left to right, and they'll have a lot of that cyclotorsion and large V pattern. So uh, not to be missed. So just wrapping up here, let me uh, go through a, a couple things to distinguish congenital from acquired. The uh, um, 
in congenital fourth nerve palsies, which again, are, are even in adults that will present with a fourth nerve palsy, you can pick out some of these features that suggest that it was a congenital palsy that decompensated with just with time. Um, you'll see that facial asymmetry like we talked about in this patient. They have much larger vertical fusional amplitudes. So you'll see uh, as, you, as you break them down, like that one patient had a, a vertical intermittent hyper of 10. You know, uh, patients without this would never be able to fuse a, 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 a hyperdeviation of 10 prison diopters um, be, with the exception of these cases. Um, congenital cases have less excyclotorsion and more vertical, whereas acquired are uh, just the opposite. Um, and a, a big, where I trained uh, um, in Indiana, they're really big advocates of traction testing to, to distinguish these. So let me, let me kind of, uh, sorry, last thing, the photo album uh, tomography scan. You go back to pictures of their childhood, you'll see a head tilt uh, in congenital cases. So, so go through just surgical decision making. There's a lot of different schools of thought about how to approach this. Um, where I was trained, a big, uh, uh, probably, the, probably the most prominent way to kind of think about these was traction testing in the OR. And what that was is that it, that it came from the theory that a congenital superior oblique palsy actually may be less uh, neurologic and maybe more anatomic, in that when you compare the superior oblique tendon and traction testing, you'll find that these patients with the palsy will have a, a, a very asymmetric laxity and the tendon will feel like you can, you can just tell that it's almost too long and thus enabling the muscle for, to, to, to kind of optimally work. So before we do every case, we do traction testing and, uh, uh, and compare between the two eyes. And often that would drive treatment. If you felt an asymmetry in that laxity, you would tuck one of the eyes to match the, the superior oblique laxity to the other eye. Uh, and interestingly, we would see a handful of cases where there would be bilateral laxity, in which case you would just go after the inferior oblique, but warn the family that this, your child probably has a bilateral superior oblique palsy, even though it's a little asymmetric is why they're still a head tilt. Um, you, would, you would do the inferior oblique myectomy or recession on one side, and then a year later you'd come out and they'd have a head tilt the other direction. And so you have to go after the other, the other inferior oblique. Um, Another way to approach it is you can think about how large the prism uh, diopter deviation is. Um, so if it's, if it's less than 15, you could probably get away with doing one muscle. And then you just, based on their, if, if, if your oblique is overacting, you address that. If, the, uh, if there's restriction in superior rectus on the same side, or you can always recess the, recess the yoke mu uh, uh, muscle on the other eye. So here's the inferior oblique, and then here's the superior oblique. Uh, Larger deviations, you often need to do more than one muscle. And then the other way to think about this is just identify which gaze uh, it's a problem. So I know this is kind of a busy slide. Let me just jump to a picture. So here's a patient. Can you tell which eye? If you had to guess, which, which eye is the superior oblique palsy in this patient? Left. <laughs> <laughs> I can hardly contain myself. That was so enthusiastic. So the, um, um, so left hyper, worse than right gaze and left head tilt. So here, if you're thinking about surgery, if you, when, you, when you see this, uh, oh, that's, that's a good sign, but it's not working. The, um, you could go after the, uh, that left eye's inferior oblique because you can clearly see it's overacting. But then if they look down and to the right, you, often see, you also see there's a lot of superior oblique underaction. So again, as you're watching this patient move their eyes, you find out, uh, what, what do you think is more useful, the down and right or up and right? down right. So this would arguably, so on this patient, they're actually doing, doing just again, kind of overlaying the um, maturity exam here. You can see that this patient has an underacting left superior oblique, and we also have left inferior oblique overaction. This patient had superior oblique uh, laxity in that left eye and was tucked. Um, so the inferior oblique is now a little bit underacting, um, but you can see that with that tucked superior oblique, you really improved that down to the looking down to the right gaze. So there's my references. Um, thank you. <laughs> any, any any questions before I turn the time over to Bob? So the three step test, when does it start really working after a certain length of time?
That's a, it's a great it's a great question. You you'll see it still work in patients who have fourth nerve palsies that don't really come out into their 80s. So what happens though with the fourth nerve palsies, you get a spread of competence. So although you'll see a much more dramatic hyper and you know like a left superior oblique palsy will look much worse in right gaze. Over time, for reasons that aren't totally clear, your 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 uh, brain or your eyes will spread that competence and make it less of an incompetent deviation and it can be much harder to tell. Over time as well, if you've had a chronic left hypertropia, your superior rectus on that same eye can get uh, tight because it's just been shortened. Um, and so when you start throwing those things in there, if you've got a tight superior rectus or a spread of competence, um, it's no longer an isolated paretic muscle. But, so to your point, it, it, it does, the longer you wait, maybe the less valid it can be, but it, we do see it working at all ages. Quite, quite effectively if, and if it's used the right, uh, right patient. Any other questions? All right, thanks.